Hey guys, welcome to episode 2 of our compelling journey to, to quantum field theory. Last time we reviewed the important elements of quantum mechanics needed to understand the development of QFT, and we ended with the symmetry representation theorem. In this episode we're going to expand on that by trying to understand what abstract logical structures capture the essence of what a symmetry is, and study that in its own right. We will then bring it down to earth by taking a close look at rotations. To that end, we ask the very simple question. What did symmetry mean to us in primary school? In school, we all studied symmetries by thinking about shapes. For example, consider the image of a square on the screen. In school, we would say the square has order four rotational symmetry and four lines of reflection. What exactly does this mean? We implicitly understood a symmetry as a transformation of the square after which it looked unchanged. This is exactly what a symmetry transformation is, even in quantum physics. But what properties, what properties do these transformations have? We're going to argue there are four fundamental properties that symmetries possess. A. Closure. If I perform a transformation, i.e. I rotate the square by pi by 2 anti-clockwise, then I perform a second transformation, i.e. another anti-clockwise pi by 2 rotation. I could have instead considered this to be a single symmetry transformation in its own right, i.e. an anti-clockwise rotation of pi radians. The property that if I combine two symmetries, I get another symmetry is called closure. Associativity. By defining the transformations as one after another, I ensure they satisfy this property. And we'll go through this property in the second slide because it's kind of technical, but hopefully you kind of have an idea of what associative means already. Um, identity. If I do nothing to the square, it looks the same. The process of doing nothing is considered a symmetry transformation called the identity. And finally, inverse. For every symmetry transformation, there is a way to undo it, i.e. we undo a pi by 2 anti-clockwise rotation with a pi by 2 clockwise rotation. These four properties instill in the most abstract sense the logical properties of a symmetry, so mathematicians define a mathematical structure with these properties as the axioms. The mathematical structure that encapsulates symmetries is called group theory. A group is a set G and a function called the composition law. The function takes in two elements of the group as its arguments and spits out another element of the group. By this definition, the statement of the function itself implies the closure property from before because the target set of the function is the group itself. The group composition law must satisfy associativity. Essentially, this just means that the order you combine elements doesn't matter, i.e. you can decide to combine g2 and g3 first, or you can choose to combine g1 and g2 first. Note that this does not imply commutativity. Identity. There exists an identity element in the group, which does nothing when combined with any other element. The identity element is always unique, uh, and you can convince yourself that this is guaranteed by the axioms. Finally, inverse. For every element of the group, there is an inverse element, which is also a member of the group. Combining an element with its inverse always gives the identity. Now, if the group composition law is commutative, and that means in this case, G1 combined with G2 equals G2 combined with G1, note that this is different from associativity in that the order of the elements is reversed rather than just deciding which two to combine first. If this is true, then it's called an abelian group. The set of all symmetry transformations on a physical system, as defined in the previous episode, will always form a group. In this case, the group composition law is successive transformations. When studying mathematical structures, it is often useful to think about structure-preserving maps. In the case of group theory, the structure we can preserve is the group composition law. Suppose I have two groups G1 and G2, and we have a function f between them. This function f is called a homomorphism if it preserves the group composition law. By this we mean that if we combine two elements of G1 using the group composition law, and then we take the result and we map it into G2, we'd get the same element as if instead we mapped the two elements individually into G2, and then we combine them using the group composition law there. If this map is a bijection, then it's called an isomorphism, and the two groups are called isomorphic. We use a funny equal sign with a tilde over it to denote this. If two groups are isomorphic, then they are the same group. Another way to state this is that through the lens of group theory, there is no way to tell these two groups apart. As a basic example, we will consider the cyclic group of order n. The elements are the identity, a, 
a squared, etc., up to a to the n minus 1. Then a to the n is just equal to the identity, and you get back to where you started, which is why it's called the cyclic group. So the group composition law can be stated using modulo addition, that a to the i combined with a to the j is a to the i plus j mod n. Then consider this other group, zn, a group in which the elements are the integers from 0 to n minus 1, and the composition law is just simply addition modulo n. There is an isomorphism between these groups, where you map a to the i into i. This preserves the group composition law, and the function is a bijection. So we say that these two groups, cn and zn, are isomorphic. Generally, when you consider a new mathematical structure, it is useful to think about how you can create instances of that structure from others, i.e. if I have known groups, can I use them to create more groups? Given two spaces, you can usually create a product space on the Cartesian product, or you could create a subspace on a subset. Then there's usually some notion of a quotient space which is applied to the identification space under some equivalence relation. This is a common theme that you'll find in many different areas of mathematics. In this section, we'll, un uh, we'll study the idea of a quotient group. So if I have some group G, in what situation can I define an equivalence relation on that group such that I can make the identification space into a group in its own right? If I have a group G and a subgroup H, I can always define an equivalence relation on G as on screen. If H satisfies this peculiar relationship above, then it's called a normal subgroup. The equivalence classes are called cosets, and this process is called coset decomposition. Rather than write G tilde, we write GH, and it is understood to mean the identification space under this equivalence relation. Recall that we argued in the first episode that an equivalence class will always partition the set to which it is applied into disjoint classes. That's why this is called coset decomposition. The question to ask is, can I make the identification space into a group? And what would the group composition law be? The answer is yes, but only if H is a normal subgroup. You can then use the natural composition law that the combination of two equivalence classes is the equivalence class of the combination of any of the two elements in them. If H is not a normal subgroup, then this group composition law is actually not well defined. Let's have an example. Consider the order six cyclic group. The elements E and A cubed form a normal subgroup, which is isomorphic to C2. There are three equivalence classes, and the identification space is isomorphic to C3, with the isomorphism shown on screen. For example, if I combine the equivalence classes of A and A squared, this gives me the equivalence class of the identity. So why do we care about quotient groups? We care because of the following theorem which we will make use of when understanding the nature of spin. If I have a surjective homomorphism between two groups, G1 and G2, recall that surjective means everything in the target set is mapped to. We can define the kernel of the map as the set of all elements of G1, which are mapped to the identity in G2. These sets are illustrated in the diagram on screen. Convince yourself that the kernel will always be a subgroup of G1. It might take a little longer to convince yourself that it will actually not always just be a subgroup, but it will be a normal subgroup. The first isomorphism theorem states that the quotient group of G1 with the kernel is always isomorphic to G2. In episode one, we discussed the symmetry representation theorem, that if we have a symmetry, we can represent it by unitary or anti-unitary operators acting on the Hilbert space. What if we consider the set of all symmetry transformations? If we applied these operators one after another on a vector, they should in some way replicate the underlying group structure. So a representation of a group is a homomorphism from the group to the general linear group on some vector space V. The general linear group is the set of all invertible linear transformations on a vector space. In the case, in the case of quantum physics, V will be the Hilbert space, and the linear transformations will be the unitary operators that represent the symmetry transformations. We will ignore the complications of anti-unitary operators for now and return to this later. Now I have a question for you. Why do we say that it has to be a homomorphism rather than an isomorphism? Pause the video and think about this. Consider why it needn't be surjective or injective. Have you thought about it? Let's start with surjectivity. If R was surjective, then every linear transformation, 
will have some element of the group that corresponds to it. Clearly there are linear transformations that aren't symmetries, so the map needn't be surjective. Injectivity is a little more tricky. If you consider a, a Lorentz scalar, like say the dot product of two four vectors, that doesn't transform under Lorentz transformations. Another way to think of this is that it does transform, but it transforms under the trivial representation of the Lorentz group, where each transformation is represented by the identity. Given this, it is clearly useful to consider these kinds of unfaithful representations, so we include them in the definition. So given a representation R, we call it faithful if it is injective. Remember that injective means one-to-one. -one. Now, we call the representation reducible if there is some subvector space W such that any element of the group acting on any vector in this subspace stays within the subspace. If the representation is reducible, we can break it up into its irreducible parts and study them separately. In particle physics, we will find it useful to identify single particles with irreducible representations and consider the entire space to be built up from these irreducible parts. This is the final slide on general group theory. Up to this point, the examples of groups we have used have all been discrete. Now we look at continuous groups. We specialize to a particular kind of group called a connected Lie group. This is not so restrictive since we will look at disconnected groups by considering their connected components. So much of what we do here can be applied more generally. Suppose we can parameterize the elements of the group by n real numbers phi to a, with a being an index that runs through from one to n. We'll keep this very general by considering the group composition law to be some arbitrary function of the two group parameters. The only thing we need to assume about the functions f a is that they may be Taylor expanded. When we say this is a connected Lie group, what we mean is that if we take the set of parameters and consider it a subspace of r to, of r n, the set of parameters must be a path connected subset. We also assume that we have picked a convention such that phi to a equals zero parameterizes the identity, and we could do this without loss of generality. If we had a quantum system that had this group as a symmetry group, we would represent the transformations by operators. Since the identity is unitary, and we can get to any element of the group by a continuous change of parameters, all the operators must be unitary, so we don't have any anti-linear, anti-unitary operators here. And then we assume they form a representation of the group, as defined in the previous slide. In terms of operators, this takes the form that the product of two operators must be the same as the operator representing the combined transformation. You can convince yourself that from the axioms of group theory, the Taylor expansion of F is set up to second order, except from the mixed term. So C A B C is actually just the mixed partial derivative of F at zero. There is also an, an analogous expansion for the operator about the identity. The unitarity of the operators implies that the operators X, A are Hermitian. These are called the generators of the transformations. By plugging both of these Taylor expansions into equation one, and then equating terms, we can derive the commutation relations between the generators. Here, f, a, b, c are called the structure constants. The set of generators here actually forms a vector space, which, when combined with these commutation relations, becomes a Lie algebra. There is an intimate relationship between the Lie algebra of a group and the group itself. We will find that representations of the Lie algebra can sometimes give us representations of the group itself by exponentiation. For the rest of this video, we'll bring together what we've learnt about group theory in the context of studying rotations. We will consider rotations of a vector in 3D Euclidean space, and use this to extract the abstract properties of the group as a whole. The group of rotations is a connected Lie group, so we will calculate the Lie algebra. In physics, when we consider transformations, we have a choice of picking active or passive transformations. If we were to take active transformations, we would consider rotating the free vector itself. However, we will consider passive rotations, where the vector remains fixed in space, but we rotate the coordinate system by an angle theta about the axis given by unit vector n. The physics is independent of convention, but there is usually a minus sign difference in the definition of some of the transformations. If you look at the diagram, you can see that we could split the vector x into x parallel, the component in the direction of n, and x perp, the component perpendicular to n. Under the rotation, the parallel component remains invariant. But what happens to x perp? Consider the plane indicated on the diagram perpendicular to the unit vector. In this diagram, the unit vector n is coming towards you out of the page. 
we can consider this a rotation in 2D Euclidean space, and then think about how we generalize this to 3D space. If we consider this a rotation of, say, the x, y axes in 2D space, we would find that the vector x perp would transform to cos theta times x perp minus sine theta times the, ve the vector perpendicular to x perp, but in this plane. So using the right-hand rule and the fact that the unit vector is out of the page, you can see that this vector is n cross x perp. We can then use these two transformation rules and a little bit of algebra to derive Rodriguez formula for the passive rotation of the vector x. We'll use this formula to extract the group properties of rotation. To find the Lie algebra and the larger group properties, we expand Rodriguez's formula to first order in theta. If we convert this to index notation, we can conveniently rewrite this to determine the free generators jk. Now, either by explicitly multiplying out the matrices or using some levi civita symbol identities, you can derive the Lie algebra. The free generators are the free by free matrices shown on screen. We'll identify these with the operators of angular momentum in QFT. We find that for larger angle rotations, we can find any rotation by taking the exponential of the parameters multiplied by the generators. The set of 3 by 3 matrices given by this formula can be shown to have two important properties. Firstly, the matrices are orthogonal. This means that their transpose is their inverse. Secondly, the determinant of all the matrices is 1. The group of rotations is usually referred to as the three-dimensional special orthogonal group, or SO3, where the S here stands for unit determinant. An important property of rotations is that it preserves the length of the vector x. It is possible to define rotations as the set of transformations that preserve the length of a vector in 3D space. However, reflections also preserve the length of the vector, so you must include the restriction to unit determinant in order to get rotations. And this completely specifies the group as well. Now we do something that might seem kind of random. We'll consider a completely different group called SU2 or the two-dimensional special unitary group. SU2 is the group of all complex two by two matrices that are unitary and have unit determinant. The most general element of SU2 can be expressed in terms of the identity matrix and the free Pauli matrices familiar from quantum mechanics. There is the further constraint that the sum of all the squares of all four parameters is one. So this leaves three degrees of freedom. To make contact with SO3, we can redefine the parameters as follows. We implicitly define an angle phi with this formula and find that it can be anywhere between 0 and 4 pi. We then define a unit vector from the other three parameters. This gives an expression for the most general element of SU2 that is eerily familiar to the expression on the previous page. In this case, the generators are given by the Pauli matrices divided by 2. We then find that the Lie algebra of SU2 is actually the same as the Lie algebra of SO3. So we found that both these groups have the same Lie algebra. They can be parameterized by a unit vector and an angle. We also found you can find the most general element by exponentiation. So you might suspect that they are the same group, i.e. there would be an isomorphism between the two. So let's try to construct such an isomorphism. If we take a general Hermitian traceless 2 by 2 matrix, the most general form of this can be written in terms of Pauli matrices and used to define a free vector. The determinant of this matrix, which we'll call nu, is minus the length squared of the free vector. So if we can find transformations of nu that preserve the hermeticity and the traceless property, we can use it to define a nu vector. If the transformation also preserves the determinant, then it will preserve the length of the vector as well. We find that the following transformations involving elements of SU2 will preserve all three of these properties. So we can use this to define an element of SO3. We find that the map from SU2 to SO3 induced by this is a homomorphism by using the fact that taking the Hermitian conjugate of the product of two matrices just conjugates both but then reverses the order. It should be noted that this is more of an outline than a rigorous construction of the proof. There are a few technical details here that would need to be looked at in a little bit more depth, but this is more of a summary. Now, is this map an isomorphism? It turns out that the kernel of this map is the identity in SU2 and minus the identity in SU2. Now this is isomorphic to Z2. So we can use the isomorphism theorem from before to see that SO3 is not isomorphic to SU2, but it's isomorphic to the quotient group of SU2 with Z2. Now this is slightly confusing. We found two groups that have the same Lie algebra, and any element of the group can be found by exponentiating the generators yet they are not the same group.
So if I find a set of free matrices that satisfy the Lie algebra, and then I exponentiate them, will I get a representation of SO3? Or will I get a representation of SU2? Or even some other group? What possibilities are there? How do I make sense of this funny relationship between the free groups? We'll find that the difference between SO3 and SU2 is not really one of algebra, but it's more one of topology. And we'll answer all of these questions in episode three. So stay tuned.